Hot 97, Carrie. Hi. Uh, Carrie Twig hanging out with us. Now, we had a chance to chat when we filmed for MTV, mm -hmm. Race in America special that we did, and I was obsessed with you, and I fell in love with you, <laughs> and I just feel that you need to talk more, and that is why you're here. Now, in case you don't know about Carrie Twig, she is the former senior advisor to Obama. You focus on culture, race, and politics, which is constantly in the news every second. Is it like when people are always like, oh my gosh, it's just so much politics. Has it always been like this and people are just noticing it now or is it just really it is a lot of more politics and race relations and conversation? I think it ebbs and flows where we definitely exist in moments where politics and culture are much more closely aligned right. than in others, right? So the 60s are definitely an era in which politics and culture were feeding off of one another and interacting in a really acute way. And we're back in that moment now. I think it's been happening for a long time. I think it started happening, you know, at the end of the Bush administration, quite right. frankly, and just has continued. And now it's at an apex where they are completely inseparable. Um, but I think that they, they obviously always have some relationship. And I, I really come from the school of thought that our politics is a symptom and a reflection of our broader culture. We wouldn't have Donald Trump as president if we didn't have the culture that we have. Right. And so our our politics come a couple years after of a, of a place we've already been. We've been in this place for a while. And so politics is a reaction to our culture. But yeah, they're absolutely in lockstep at this moment. How was it working for Obama? I mean, it, it was amazing and I think uh, the White House is a really magical place under any circumstances, but you, particularly when we were there, it was filled with young, brilliant people of color right. who like, believed really passionately in their ability to serve their country and to make the world better. And you had a leader at the top who set the inner culture of the White House and who set the culture of our mission who was a once in a generation kind of mind, who had a once in a generation kind of story. And that informed a lot of our choices and a lot of our the way we went about our day to day work. And, you know, that was an exceptional time full of people who just really were there for the right reasons and who represented the future of the country. Right. You know, I mean, in some ways I look back, <laughs> it's just crazy. Like we're 20 somethings running around getting to do things that maybe <laughs> we're like, right. a we're a stretch, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'll only speak for myself. I right. have really talented colleagues, but there were some days when I was just like, this doesn't seem right. <laughs> like You're letting me do this, you know? It, yeah, that's a great sign that, you know, good people are in places that, um, can make a difference for our country, but now I don't feel that as much. How do you how do you explain what's happening in the White House right now? Oh God, I mean, it's, I actually have, you know, by, I have these moments when it's just so unbelievable because right. it was something we took so seriously. There was not a day that went by that I walked through the gates of that building and did not have a moment of awe Right. And sometimes, you know, it's still your workplace. And so your head's down. Maybe you're late. Maybe you didn't do something you should have done or you're worried about something. But at some point every single day there, it is a humbling place that will remind you why you are there. And so when you see for me now, when I see people who don't seem to be taking it as seriously, who don't understand the the magnitude of the responsibility of that building, that there are life and death choices that actually occur in that building. It, it's right. it's really heavy and hard on my heart. Yeah. Um, I think, though, that it's, it's a, you know, we're also seeing something really magical happen in that our culture is really putting boundaries on what could be a catastrophic situation. I don't want to say that it's not bad, right? There are people who are actively being harmed right now as we speak because right. of the choice of, choices made in that election. However, we're seeing the judiciary step up. We're seeing the free press step up. We're seeing the people step up in a way that is really making sure that the power of that office is limited, which I think is a phenomenal thing to see when you when you have institutions that are kind of re again finding their purpose. Right. Carrie, what are some issues, policies, or anything of the above that we should be aware of that maybe there's so much distraction out here that we're losing sight of the real issues and that could potentially, you know, impact all 
all of our lives in a very negative way. <laughs> you <laughs> yeah. know, like, I guess the impact in a positive way, because I feel like these issues could possibly hurt us in a very, very catastrophic way. Yeah, that's such a tough question it, because yeah. the answer is all of them. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's not one thing, it's another. Right. Um, and so I think what... We have to get out of the we have to get out of a mentality that has a siloing all of these issues, right? Because education is about uh, the economy, and the economy is about um, the environment, and the environment is about your health, and your health is about like it's it's all interconnected, and they all influence each other. And so, as difficult as that is to wrap our heads around as individuals, we we do have to care about all of it. Right. I think if I could encourage people to do one thing, it's really ramp up their level of knowledge of how power works. Mm. You have got to understand how elected officials come to be in power in your city, in your state, in your county, on the federal level. You have got to understand those mechanisms. You have to understand, do you have a strong mayor or a weak mayor? Does your mayor appoint your, poli your police chief? Right. Or do you elect a sheriff that chooses? Like they're, and they different. It's a different answer all over the country. And you right. have to know what those answers are and follow the power because the, that's ultimately at the end of the day that's the deal when i was really young the thing that got me involved in politics is when i was really young i asked my mom what government was and she told me it's old white men sitting in a room deciding how free you are and that yeah, yeah <laughs> that is still I mean, like the still most the same that's the most succinct definition of what government is right and politics is the means through which we select that government Right. And so you have got to pay attention to how that power flows and who those people in the sitting in the room are. And do you want me sitting in a room deciding your, about your freedom or do you want somebody else? Right. right. And that's that's essentially the basic question. And these people matter. These low level offices. I mean, everything matters so much. And before you even you don't have to be a policy expert. Right. Is the thing. And I think that's really daunting I think that's for what people. Makes people. Yeah. And so I get that, and I, you don't have to, I'm not a policy expert, right. really. <laughs> I can speak passionately and I have my opinions, but I'm not somebody who has spent my life in academia with 30 years of experience about what happens when you know you do fracking. Like I, right. I don't, right? Um, but I do know who my members of Congress are and I do know what they'll vote for and I do have a basic understanding of what my principles are and so that if there's one thing that more people need to do particularly young people particularly people of color it's understand exactly where the power lies and how it gets doold out is that as simple as googling kind of okay. yeah basically just want to make it a very easy because i understand this is so overwhelming there's yeah. so many issues and i totally get it because at times you're just like i just hate the tv i hate the news i hate oh, everyone it's but it's like finding digestible ways for people to gain control of their life and our country because it's for the people so i think googling and understanding who gets to be in power and how you can affect that is very important. Mm -hmm. And I think people always get, you know, discouraged because it's so like, oh, well, now that this person's in the White House, there's nothing I could do. Well, there's there are things you can do. Absolutely. And it depends. Like, listen, if you care about um if you care about racial justice, if you care about ending police brutality, if you care about the equitable and uh, equitable treatment of citizens in your country, regardless of race, right? If you think we should all be treated with dignity, you should know who your DA is. Right. Right. And that should be the election that you pay the most attention to. You should know right. who your attorney general is. You should know who your juvenile judges are. Are they appointed or are they elected? Like, though, there are ways to hone in and to make the. Uh, problem a little bit more narrow and I and so because I completely get how daunting it is yeah but there's you know there's a, what's that saying there's 50 different ways to eat an elephant really <laughs> so yeah like there's a lot of different ways to approach this monumental task right and it's really about just starting somewhere and building out your knowledge in the same way that we learn anything in the right. same way that you learn any skill it's just about starting the process right. finding one answer and then being like okay so we have a mayor the mayor appoints for deputy mayors who are those people what are they in charge of what else does he appoint how do they do it when do they do it do right. i have a say do i not have a say <laughs> one thing that's fairly obvious is that white folks um really well, 
guilt is a paralytic. And no one likes to be made to feel guilty. And then right. when you do feel guilty, you're just like, Sh- I don't know what to do. How do I and deal how do I? This? And so it's a very human thing to then become defensive. Right. Right. And so I also think that, and so especially if you think that you didn't do anything wrong, right? right. If I'm, you know, my older brother is white. And if like my older brother, his name is Clint. And if I go to Clint and was like, you did this and you did this to black people, he'd be like, what are you talking about? Like, remember right. that time? I Like my little sister's black. Like re- <laughs> I found right. her bike when it got stolen. <laughs> right. Like he hasn't done. He's just like, I didn't do anything. And I use that as an example because so often that's that's true you haven't actually done anything other than operate in the system in which you were born but neither have we right Right. neither is anybody else and that's that doesn't mean there's not a problem that we then have to address right we're still all here and so it's hard for and, and also like our tearing down of that privilege calls into question an identity that because of the political moment we're in matters more and more um And so if I say that I'm going to try and take away privilege and you hear that as my my identity. Right. Then you're trying to strip me of something that may feel like the only thing you actually have. Right. And that's very deeply important. And I think there is something to be said about the real. I think there there's not everyone is does this in good faith. But I think there's something legitimate to the confusion that a lot of white folks feel when they can say, you know, when we can have, I'm when we can have Issa saying, I'm only, I'm rooting for all the black people to win. Mm -hmm. And like, well, that's not racist, but then I'm suddenly this horrible person. And it's obviously not a fair analogy, but I think there is deep confusion that exists within them that are like, what am I allowed to do? I don't know what I'm, I don't know what I'm, I'm so am I supposed to feel guilty? Right. And that's not helpful, right? As you said, we have to give people space to have a dialogue. But they are, you know, I shouldn't even say us and them, like they, but, um, you know, I think people who are deeply ensconced and have not had to suffer the consequences of what the society can mean or haven't had proximity to somebody of color or haven't had an experience in which they have been the perpetrator Right. They are at a loss and probably are thinking about it for one of the first times. I think people of color, we talk about identity and race constantly. All the time. White people don't talk about it at all. Yeah. Like, I, no. <laughs> at all. Like, it literally doesn't occur to them. Yeah. And so I think that there is just a real gap of experience talking. They don't feel comfortable and they don't feel safe and they don't feel able to express themselves. And then they have this layer of guilt that is a paralytic. Yeah. That keeps them out of a meaningful dialogue. And, you know, again, black people or people of color should not have to bear the burden of trying to fix this. This is something that white folks need to fix for right. themselves. But we could also throw them a bone occasionally yeah. and just allow them to be a little indelicate in that process. Right? right. And help and be graceful with them as they try and figure this stuff out, assuming that they are acting in good faith. I'm not saying someone has a hood on their head. Yeah. That you should have them over for dinner. Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> like, no. But um, just you know, they don't talk about it and they don't think about it in the same way that we do because it's not a daily part of their life. I was going to ask, so your brother's white. Yeah. So how, have you two had conversations about this? And I mean, maybe this is a learning experience for others who are watching like, oh, okay, these are the steps. Maybe this is how the conversation can happen. Anything that you were able to take from those, I guess, brother sister moments and like oh you know what this worked for us maybe try this yeah so my family history is my mother is white Mm -hmm. uh, my father is black my older brother is from my mom's first marriage but he was raised by my father from the time he was about 18 months old I also have two older brothers on my dad's side so I have two black brothers one white brother and then my sister and I in between so we were like a little roving rainbow push (laughs) coalition in the go-go 80s yeah um in small town Ohio which was hysterical. Wow. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> which was a thing. Which is, as, yeah. it, as it turns out. Yeah. Um, so I have lots of experience yeah. with white folks. Um, and, you know, I think because he was my older brother, he's been protective and came to those issues much faster than probably most people did. So I didn't have to do a ton of explaining to him. But I went to a predominantly white school, had pre- all my best friends from K through 12 are white girls, right? And 
for me with them, that was really difficult. I, I really had to push them to, and still to this day occasionally have to push them to see what I'm talking about right. and to believe, like to reflexively believe black people, right? To this day, there are some of my girlfriends, we're now in our 30s, 30, 31, 32. My father is the only black person that's ever been able to tell them what to do. Like we've never had a black teacher. We didn't have a black mm. cop, no black firefighters, no black school administrators. They've never had black bosses. They've never had black professors. They've never had a black person be able to tell them what to do aside from my dad. Wow. When we were like kids. Wow. <laughs> you know, and that's the experience for millions and millions right. of people. And so they have no, they have like their prejudice is so deeply seated, even if it's not, uh, even if it's not malicious. Right. They're not malicious, but they just have no experience, no knowledge. And so I have to push them really hard to believe that something is true because it count it contradicts everything that they think. Cops are there to be nice to you and they are there to help right. you. That has been their experience every single time they've interacted with a police right. officer. And so when I tell them stories about my interactions or those of people that are in my life now or of my father, right. they're like, oh, how could this happen? Right. And it's like, now multiply that times a million. And look at these stats. And look at, these are guys who get pulled over 60 times in a year, 80 times in a year. Like, how is that? It's not just one person. It's right. not a one, you need, I need you to help understand. And I need you to believe what's being told. And that's, that's been the first thing. One, like, teaching people to recognize the implicit biases in all of us. Right. And two, getting them to reflexively believe that other people are telling the truth about racism and their experiences with it. I love that you say that because it's like, why don't you believe me? Because it, count, it counter contradicts their entire life. Right. They've never experienced that. They've never seen Santa their Claus dad. Santa Claus isn't real either. You know? Like, well, you know what? Like, it's so true. But get like, with it. It's like, it was, you know, it's so, it's, it's funny you even say that. So, you know, when it's almost Halloween. Oh, God. And little kids dress up and <laughs> yes. like do the little parades around. Yeah. My sister was Santa Claus one year and all the kids teased her and told her Santa Claus isn't black and made her cry, and so my grandma had to come and get her. And it wasn't Santa Claus isn't real, it was Santa Claus isn't black, like this isn't for you. On a day in which you dress up, right? And they, like, they oh are my. so self-assured from such a young age that certain things are theirs. And so tapping into it is like a very disorienting experience for a lot of white people. Can you explain, because I know we talked about it before, implicit bias. Yeah. and how that really does affect all of us. So implicit bias is the set of beliefs or opinions or values that you hold that you're not conscious of. Okay. So they are internal, they are, they are things that you have passively absorbed that you weren't explicitly taught. Right. right. If someone teaches you to hate black people, that is an expressed, that is explicit Very bias, clear. that is prejudice, that is racism. It's racism. Right? You're right. If you weren't taught those things, but you probably weren't taught anything at all right and you just act passively absorbed the things that are around you the things you've seen in the media which we know the media has a distorted view particularly of black people but really of most non-white non-straight right. cis white people right um then you are getting a lot of negative uh images and if you don't know how to counter them and even if you do but if you, you, you're, you're constantly taking in these negative images and that fills up your knowledge of who these people are mm -hmm. and then forms your opinions and forms the assumptions that you make in a, in a snap, mm. right? right? So you might be able to intellectually say, oh wait, give me 15 seconds and I will not make this assumption. But for the most part, we all make our opinions and our assumptions in, a, in right. fractions of a second. And if you're loaded with this implicit bias, that is what informs all of that decision making. Mm -hmm. And it's really difficult to kind of unpack all of that. And the reality is we all have it. Whether the, va the vast majority of people do not grow up in a perfectly diverse right. community with no access to the mainstream media, like it just doesn't happen. And social media. <laughs> and, and social media, everything. Right. And so the majority of us have some level of sexism homophobia, racism, xenophobia, 
or a combination of all of those things, right? right? So there's these tests that you could take that gauge your implicit bias. And like, I'll admit it's humiliating, but I failed it. Like I did horribly. I have a lot of, I had a lot of internal sexism. I had a lot of internal racism, right? right? Because it's just, it's there in all of us. And so you have to, despite the fact that I had all these images in my life and I have this family that's full of wonderful people of color right. and that's diverse and blah, blah, blah. I still, we all still have it. And so you have to, recognizing that is the first step. Right. You can recognize it, then you can change your, your community, you can make different choices, you can hang out with different people at work, you can go, you can occasionally visit another church or another part of town or speak to somebody else. You can start actually engaging in the process, but you have to recognize you have a problem first. How do you know if you have a problem or not? We all do. Yeah. <laughs> if all you do. are alive. Yeah, then you have a problem. <laughs> it just country. depends on how big the problem is. Exactly. But there's nothing wrong with looking at yourself and saying, hey, yes, I might be a good person. I do this, but I could be better. I could do totally. better. I can work on these things. And that's the beautiful part about life is that we have the opportunity while we are still here and alive to become better. Mm -hmm. Not just, oh, I just want to do better for others. Like, no, do better for yourself. Absolutely. Because it will show. It's going to exude onto other people. And I think that's uh, always the hardest part is trying to get people to put that mirror up to your face and say, hey, look, you know what? Yeah, I am not all that, you know? Yeah. And it's okay that you're not all that, but do something about it. How do you explain to someone who does not understand that reverse racism does not exist? Because I have these conversations and I think it's like, oh, I, I, what is reverse racism? Because I do hear that a lot of times. That, Absolutely. Oh, it's a uh, black and black crime, people of color, this hates that and more, you know, um, this person hates that, Latin, this. And it's always, well, what about reverse racism? Right. Well, and so this gets into a semantic difference that I recognize is really tough for people. As we just said, everyone can have bias. We can all have we can prejudices. All be prejudiced. We can right. all be prejudiced. But racism specifically is about power. More than anything right. else, it is about power. And in this country, yes. it is not possible for people of color to be racist because we do not have the ability to build a society that is at the exclusion of white people. We are, it's, that die has been cast. Yeah. <laughs> like that, it's not, we missed that window of opportunity. It's not possible. So. It is not possible. Racism is about power. It's about can you systematically exclude a single group of people or small group of peoples based on some visual identifier mm. from opportunity, from education, from economic stability, from social justice, from racial justice, from j justice period. Right. And that's what racism is. And it's the, the ideas, the racist ideas that individuals have sup support these systems and support this domination of power held by one group of people. And I know this is such a loaded question. What can people do to fight that on the easiest level? Because, look, there's so much. Absolutely. But what would you say, someone who's young watching, who's just like, what is the first step I can do? Because I don't like that. I don't want that. I don't want that in power. It's not right. It really, the country should really represent what it says freedom, liberty, and justice for all, but we know that's not happening. So what can I do to hold our country accountable for, you know, the nice promo that it puts out there, but it's not <laughs> living up to? Yeah, I mean, first, one step one, make sure that your own house is in order. Know what your biases are and do your best to mm. learn because un figuring out how to deal with your own is going to equip you a lot better to help other people de deal with theirs. Like this. Right? Mm -hmm. And it's not easy and it's not useful to try and teach somebody from the mountaintop. Right. Right? Like, don't put yourself on a high horse. Right. Figure out how you did it for yourself and help other people do it for themselves in a way that facilitates conversation as opposed to talking down to somebody and being condescending. It's difficult and it's embarrassing, right? It's it is embarrassing to admit these things because there's a social cost to being ignorant. Um, and so one, step one, figure out how to unpack your own stuff. Right. Uh, second of all, be really thoughtful about your habits and your routines and your patterns. 
and invite people into them, right? So make your circle of friends diverse. Make right. sure you go to places and have experiences with the intention of trying to learn and trying to expand and trying to let go of rigid boundaries of your identity. Right. Right? That is so important because if those people are part of you, if they're part of your circle, if they're part of who you think belong, you are going to stand up for them, you're gonna defend them and you're gonna do so reflexively because they're part of your family or your crew or whatever. Right. Third, be will really willing to have uncomfortable conversations and be forgiving of yourself and be forgiving of anyone else. So again, assuming people are operating in good faith. Again, again. for sure, yes. Uh, this is not licensed to say whatever you want. Right, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, find someone, find places where you can ask questions and where you can help yourself learn and be really educated so that you know the words to use, so that you understand why it's important that you talk in a particular way about certain people or yourself, right? right. When people are trying to do that same thing, don't hold it to be like, hey, remember that time you said something really stupid? Like, don't hold it over someone's head. Be really gracious and forgiving as people try and learn. I think if we don't give people space to learn, they're never going right. to. Right, don't criminalize someone over and over. Allow them to grow. Allow them to face their error and make it right. Right, absolutely. And that's just good advice across the board. Yeah, in everything, <laughs> in right? Everything. In life. <laughs> yeah. just if you're going to forgive and move on, just yeah. get over it. And I mean, it's like, it's one thing when you know someone who's not as informed as you, right? And they want to do right, they just don't know where to go. Yeah. They don't. And it's okay to ask those very delicate questions because it gets uncomfortable. I feel like every time race conversation comes up, it turns into, oh God, oh God. But it doesn't have to be like that. And right. I think that's also the problem in our country is that it's so uncomfortable to even say race relations and black, white, other, whatever. It just turns into this like, okay, let's talk about something else. Yeah. And it's like, well, that's why we are where we are exactly. now. Because I remember you talking about this. It's never truly been addressed, um, the issues that our country has gone through since the beginning of time and those issues are still with us i mean it's it's like literally a chapter in a history book if that oh slavery happened and the story oh natives they're not here but we right and i think that i believe education has failed so many people in our country which is why they have false ideas of what is really happening out here and why people why we feel how we feel it's not we're not crazy right. so can you just talk a little bit about that because i think people are like well why is this all happening i don't understand i mean civil rights happened like right. what's going on yeah i mean you bring up a really good point which is educate i mean education failed by your standard if our education system was built to protect white supremacy, then it succeeded miraculously. Absolutely. Yes, <laughs> so, absolutely. You know, when slaves are referred to as workers, right? and we don't mention the genocide that we perpetrated on Native Americans in this right. country, right? So so it succeeded by the standards of yeah. white, of a white, you know, white supremacy. Um, but yeah, people feel really blindsided by what is happening because they, they have not been exposed to the fact that it has been happening since day one there have been re there has been rebellion in this country since day one right. right and not just by black people but by anyone but by multiple people who whiteness was foisted on and that were uh, um that were oppressed and so people need to un like it has been going on since the the, the inceptions before the inception of right. this country and in fact you know we don't like to remember the Revolutionary War through the, those terms. Like that can be celebrated. Right. <laughs> that's a, that's a rebellion we're celebrating. Right. But anyone else trying to get free? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> not allowed. Um, and and so I, I you know I I think your point is right that we have undereducated and and maleducated. I don't even know. I think I might have just made that word up. I like but it. So I know exactly <laughs> what you mean. Yes. Maleducated um, people into, in particular young people, into thinking that the, we had a really peaceful history as a nation around this issue, right. which we just didn't, right? And I also think racism changes um, and particular bigotry changes. And we go from a period in history where 
it was biological, right? Black people, the ens enslaved Africans were biologically not human, they were cattle, right? And then we recognize their humanity, but they, uh, they were still treated with disgust and with disdain and with inferiority, right? And now it's, we're really living in a period of time that's, about, that's more defined by resentment than anything else, mm. in which black people are being resented for any progress that they make. They are being resented for their dignity. They are being resented um, in a time of shrinking kind of economic opportunity when the world is just changing in such a rapid way that now anyone's success, it's become a zero sum game where a lot of non, or a lot of non people of color or white folks think that, you know, any gain that someone, that a person of color makes is a, is a loss to them. Right. Which just isn't, how the world works um <laughs> right not real it's just not okay. a, yeah it's not a thing um but that's where a lot of people are stuck and so they're stuck in this place of resentment and that's a really hard feeling to un uh to undo but i think the reality is that young people particularly are also at the same time while simultaneously this resentment is building you also have young people who are living in the most diverse generation of human beings of all time right right at no point in human history have we seen a generation of human beings on this planet anywhere in this planet right. that is as diverse and as uh uh multi and like biracial multiracial multi-ethnic right. as this current generation and so it's just not as easy of a construction. Whiteness and blackness and these even like, like even us talking about being black or white is like such an outdated concept. Right. It's like so, it's so out of Cause state. It, it, yes. Because it doesn't make, it's, it's doesn't a fabrication, make... it's a construction from a bygone era right. and it just doesn't work anymore. And so young people are growing up and they're like, what you guys are talking about doesn't even make sense, but they don't yet have the tools because we don't as grownups have the tools we never found them ourselves. They don't have the tools to have these discussions. And so our work really needs to mm. be about how do we, as uh, adult citizens in this country, talk to young people about the power and the agency they have to change the outcome of this country and to change the future. Mm. You're right that they, are no, they weren't educated in a way that gave them the information, but it's on us as community members right. to give them the tools to educate themselves because now they can reach any information anywhere in the yes. world. Yes. <laughs> right? Any, like yes. the truth be there, girl. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's like, right there. <laughs> it's right there. Look it up. And here's how you here's how you actually talk about it. here's some of the tools and here's where we failed. Like we should be honest about how our generations and the ones that are older than us have really come up short yep. and done an injustice to to these legacies. Um, and then also really, and this is something that I'm particularly obsessed with, like helping kids to understand the power that they have. Mm. If all 18 year olds voted, yeah. if every single one of them voted in every single election, we would live in a radically different world. We would live in it. The world would be so different to, as to be unrecognizable. Mm. And that is something that is real and true and not hyperbolic. Right. And so how do we get them to understand that it's not when you're our age that right. you have power, it's now. And it's now when you have radical great ideas and stuff that like we haven't even thought of or we've missed our ability to implement. Mm -hmm. Like they can just upend this world and like, here's how you do it. Read this, yeah. <laughs> talk to your friends about this and then go do that like, yeah. and then come up with some ideas, right? And I think that is a, that's a huge piece of the education that's missing too. It's one thing to know your history. It's one thing to know the stats and you should know who Frederick Douglass is and you should know right. who Fannie Lou Hamer is and all these things, right? But you should also know that you have an extraordinary amount of power to shape your world and your, your crew and your society and this country. And America is the greatest exporter of culture in the world. Oh yeah. American culture is global culture. Mm -hmm. And so if we change American culture, we will change the world and, I, and, that's, and that's real, right? Oh, very real. That was so beautifully put. I was just like, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> it's great. What are your thoughts when you hear the president call neo-Nazis in Charlottesville as fine people and then go on this whole rant talking about peaceful protesting in the NFL, those who have been kneeling because of social injustice? Because that's what this is all about. This is what 
everybody has been talking about and kneeling for, and then refers to them as SOBs. And then the outcome of it being co-opted. What are your thoughts on it? I mean, first of all, first of all, yeah. pres- I mean. And we could break it up in a couple parts, because. Yeah. President Trump is um, beyond a disappointment. Mm-hmm. Um, he feels like a relic. I mean, I think he's intentionally a relic of a right. of a past era, mm-hmm. right? Um, and he's very intentionally trying to create a cultural civil war in this country. Um, and, uh, you know, I think he, rep- he obviously represents the past and he represents division. And uh, so I don't, but he's also represents something that's always been here. Yes. Um, and something that we've been chipping away at, chipping away at. And sometimes we make leaps of progress and sometimes we, we slide back down the mountain a little right. bit. Um, but I think he will be kind of the last great relic of a bygone era. And so I tend to not uh, put... He also, he also just seems personally incredibly erratic yeah. and ill-informed and unprepared and um so i tend not to p- put much stock into what right. he says by right. any stretch of the imagination um and his crassness is just absurd mm-hmm. right i love a swear word swear word, a swear word as much as the next person but like you're the president my god right like you're... have comport yourself with some dignity and it's just no it's just embarrassing and 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 you know, I think it just demonstrates how small of a person he is because every single time he does this and every time he tries to humiliate somebody, those people, he just shows off how small he of a of a spirit he is and of a mind right. he is, which is which is really unfortunate to be the, the president of the United States. Um so there's that. I think that the the co-opting of his language and the co-opting of what that and then also that's not even to say how absurd it is for a president of the United States to so mangle the the very first enumerated right of American citizens in yes. this country and in this constitution. The very first one. The yeah. very first and one. It and just, oh, I know, <laughs> yes, people have, you know, their freedom of speech. And, oh, mind you, it's also peaceful. And, right, and, exactly. Oh, but that doesn't matter. Right. That doesn't matter? Right. It's crazy. I mean, it's 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 unbelievable it's insane and like trying to when i actually do try and wrap my head around it i really do come up at a loss for words like it's, yes. it's incomprehensible to me um in a way that makes me sad yeah. and um because you know i've spent my entire adult life working for this in service to the principles and ideals of this country and so to see him mangle them so badly Most and dangerous. intentionally and carelessly yes you know it's careless and it's cavalier and it um and that is sad to me as somebody who uh works really hard to make those ideals real right, right. um so there's that i think the co-opting is actually i think that may be the only element of this that was intentional Mm -hmm. right i think he gets on a stage and he gets a mic and he gets really excited and he just says whatever he wants because he thinks he can without consequence um but he has been really intentional about co-opting uh identity and co-opting movements since throughout his presidential election and his presidency right and so we now hear the neo-Nazis that he heralds as fine people using the same language of identity politics that started in the 80s and the 90s, right? When you start, when when they put, uh, when they use terminology that was started as a way for oppressed peoples to advocate for their uh, rights, you now have a dominant group trying to use that, co-opt and use that same language as though they are oppressed under the veil of oppression. Right. And so that's been something that's been happening on the far right. And so we know that he is obviously in close contact with that, with that part of our country and that that is, you know, who he gets a lot of his ideology from. And so it's actually not surprising to watch him co-opt. It's alarming 
to hear media and formerly moderate people echo it and not understand it for what it is and not recognize or at least not be honest about recognizing right. it for what it is and uh in the same way that i was saying earlier that as as that we are seeing some really good journalism right now right we're also seeing some really really horrendous. horrible journalism like, like people horrible. who are completely unwilling to tell the truth yes. that is staring them in the face and that they know yeah and it's just outrageous it is. and like the, the complete lack of fortitude and lack of courage uh, that some people have is just obscene. Yeah. Um, and so that that's, but we're going to see that more often. I think we're going to see that co-opting right. of activism and activist language um, to cloak themselves as saviors mm. while condemning people who are embodying the true spirit of peaceful protest and of trying to encourage dialogue in the country. Um, I have never been much of a NFL person and so this is the easiest boycott I've ever participated Hello. in. Hello. <laughs> we'll say. That's what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. It was a lot harder to give up Uber. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I'm I'm like I'm like a pioneer of the boycott. Yes. The NFL. I love yeah. it. I love it. Yes. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. It makes me very happy to hear that because it's absolutely crazy. And I think, I don't know if you had a chance to see everything today, but last night, the Cowboys owner, Jerry Jones, as well as the players, they kneeled before the anthem and then got up during the anthem. And these owners have also all have um, supported Trump one way or another. It's like yeah, and public nine knowledge. of them gave yeah, over a million dollars to his inauguration. To pay for his committee. inauguration, yeah. and they're also the ones who have said that uh, they wouldn't allow anybody to kneel on their team, and and they would fire them. Yes, they did exactly what Trump told them to do because Colin is still out of a job. Yeah. So now they're trying to put this cute show on of, oh, no, we believe in your freedom of speech. Now, how do you explain to someone who doesn't understand? They're just saying, oh, this is all kneeling. So now is it cool to watch? Is it not? How would you simply explain to them, no, you can't support that because they're basically trying to steal um, a boycott that started because of addressing social injustices i would say boycotts aren't supposed to be easy hello protest is not supposed to be easy it's about sacrifice right yes. it is a and that's the entire point you don't move a needle by you don't move the needle in a protest by saying I'm going to boycott something I'm giving up anyway. Like right. that's just not the entire point is you saying I am willing to give up something that means something to me in order to make that thing better. And so if you're an NFL plan, fan, if you love a certain player, if the team means everything to you, if you haven't missed a game, since you were two, you are the exact person who should not be participating because you know what you're really saying? You're saying, I love the NFL and I love my team and I love watching football and it's part of my family, it's part of my tradition, it's part of my pastime, but I, I demand it be better. And so I'm going to help it save it from itself right. by not participating. Simple. That is so, that is what a boycott is supposed to be. It's supposed to be a push to make something you love better. Right. And if it's not, if you're like me and you just you weren't gonna watch anyway, like then I can crack a joke about it, right. but like and I'll I'll tweet or whatever. But I'm not the you know it it you have to you have to love the thing you're trying to save exactly, and that's what makes it very important. And I think people are always like, well, what does that mean? Like, what does that really mean if I don't watch? It's like, well, viewerships go down, you know, when it's contract time to come up. And these numbers are negotiated with the NFL and they see numbers going down. It affects their money one yep. way or another, whether it's through sponsors, whether it's contracts through networks. So, yes, you might not think it's going to have an immediate effect, but it does. Mm -hmm. And when you want equality and justice and freedom for everybody, it's a long marathon. Absolutely. And you've been doing this for how long? Right. Yeah. And you know how much work is left and you probably won't see all the outcomes that you wanted 
during your lifetime and probably your kids' lifetime and their and their kids' lifetime. Let's be a hundred right. with this, right? Right. So we're not doing it for our self instant gratification. We know the sacrifices that we all make. We're just hoping that it will change our country and the world to be a better place eventually. Absolutely. So I think it's always selfish whenever I hear someone say, well, what's that going to do when I don't watch? And like, what does it mean? It's like, well, it's all about math. It's numbers, mm -hmm. you know? And I, it, it makes me sad at times when people don't get it, but it's part of the lack of education as well, you know? So, yeah. so at this point, I don't know if you also saw, and I thought it was so interesting now basketball, this coach, uh, and I'm not really big on basketball coaches like that because I, of the okay. Spurs. Yes. I saw that on my way over here. Yeah. Okay. I was like, oh, I should watch this because I bet we're going to talk about sports. Yes. Get so, myself together. <laughs> Coach Greg Popovich, I think I'm saying his name right, he actually talks so, like, I don't know. He's just so eloquent when he speaks yeah. about this. And it's so great because he's so informed on white privilege. And do you think it upsets white people who don't believe this is real to hear it from a white person more so than when they hear it from us they're like oh there they go again but hearing him talk about hey white privilege is real yeah i think if they get upset then they get upset regardless right then they are just upset okay, about the topic right i think i think uh that more white people need to do what he is doing because I think white people will hear it from absent being a sibling or a daughter or grandmother. Like I talked to my grandmother about these types of things. Um, absent it being someone who you are very close with, who you love, whose life matters to you. It's easier to hear it from someone who is going through the same experience as you are. And I think that right. more, if more white people were having that discussion, it would be much less of an uphill battle that for us to start actually acting on how we dismantle some of that privilege. Um, and trusted allies are really important. It's great to see an old white dude with like the hair, with like white hair and the beard out yeah. there doing, you know, I think that's so great and courageous. And like, it's actually, I don't know that, I don't want to take back courageous. I mean, it's not as courageous as a lot of things. I think facts right. are facts, right? And he will pay a far, he won't pay a penalty for having that discussion in the way that we do. Oh man. Um ob obviously. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh man. But it's it's I'm still heartened that he did it, right? And yeah. I think if more white people were having that conversation even in quiet ways, I also think that people don't like to have their butt showing in public, right? And so right. We need a lot of the we need that conversation to happen at the dinner table. Mm. We need that conversation to happen when you're in the golf cart or when you're not, you know, right. sawing wood at Lowe's or like whatever, whatever dudes you do. do. Yeah. <laughs> whatever you guys do, yeah. have it there. And you don't have to publicize it. You don't have to say, now, yes, we've been wrong this whole time because we know that's never going to happen. Right. Ever. And yes, maybe some may admit to it, but they're the ones who've always known that it's existed and they're okay with dealing with it. Now, looking forward and hopefully to happier times, what do you, th I don't want to say what are your predictions, but what are your hopes as far as what you would like to see for our country and where we're going? I'm an, I am uh, by nature an optimist, and right. so I tend to get real rosy about uh, anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, oh, but if you explain it calmly and rationally, people understand. Yeah. Turns out human beings are irrational. Yeah. Uh, um, I, you know, I have a lot, a lot, a lot of faith and and hope for kids who are now like 13, 14, 15. And they're growing up in a way to be so much more sophisticated, so much more right. connected, so much more able to imagine and to build for themselves a world that we would have really had to struggle to do because we didn't have the internet because we just didn't have a way of connecting with all these people who were so different we weren't as exposed right. to so many different things and i think they are starting to um they can come at they come with a worldview that is intuitively more 
inclusive than ours is. Right. We have to work for a lot of that. And I think if we can keep them and scaffold the future in a way so that they can keep kind of the magic of being able to have access to um, a really diverse group of or view of the world, then we're going to be in a really, um, really good spot. I also, though, think, and this is the part where perhaps a little bit of my optimism falters, is this isn't a future, you know, by 2040, the country is going to be majority non-white. Right. By 2050, and I think that's actually shallow. I think that's low. You know we don't report on census. Yes. Um, and by 2050, 20% of the country is supposed to be biracial and multiracial, right? But you can't birth or die your way into right. a pluralistic, you know, it's just not going to work like that. Yeah. There has to be intention and there yes. needs to be very meaningful work that has to happen. And so I'm optimistic about what that generation can accomplish. I'm less optimistic that our generation and the ones above us will do in mass what is necessary right. in order to set them up for success right. in terms of having a, a, a better, more vibrant world. And the and being able to experience the richness that the world provides by just being able to talk to other people who have different traditions. Like people are human beings are so fascinating and interesting. Culture is so fascinating and interesting. To make your culture as narrow as possible see, is is kind of crazy. Yes. Right? Like you are missing so much of what makes life beautiful. Right. Um, but we have to very intentionally scaffold the future for them, right? Which means how do we build systems and redesign systems so that in addition to having a demographic shift, there's also a real power shift, real economic power that starts going yes. to a diver that, that same group of people and isn't isolated and contained by a very small percentage of people who also tend to look alike, yes. right? How does political power transfer and how do we how do we emphasize and, and build up political power in black and brown communities? How do we start rewarding cultural power? Right. American culture is black culture, mm -hmm. period. Jazz, rock and roll, sports, all of it. Hip hop, yes, all of it, yeah. right? Um, and there is no distinction between African-American culture and American culture. They are the same thing. Yep. And yet, if we rewarded cultural influence mm. the same way that we economically reward financial or you know technological creation um we would have probably what like 50 black billionaires <sighs> at least <laughs> you know what i mean chuck berry <laughs> at least at least like we'd be visiting chuck berry's house not graceland You're right <laughs> um and that's that's real and 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 so how do we redesign systems but that's an intentional system that kept that keeps our creators out of those circles. And I don't, and that's not just black, that's just across the board. Right. And so how do we redesign systems so that people of influence and people who are creating and people who are, you know, on fleek, chick who said on fleek, she should have a million dollars. Yes. Right? Like you can go down to the street and find buy a bag that says on fleek and a mug. Right. You know, she doesn't have a copyright on Nothing. that. She hasn't seen a dime, I would yeah. imagine. Um, and so how do you actually redesign systems so that we reward people for the work that they're doing? And and again, you can't just you can't just hope that a bunch of brown babies are born and racism is solved. It's not going to work that it's way. Not right? work. The kids with tiki, tiki torches were kids. That's on a yep. college campus. Yep. Um, we can't just hope that old racists are going to die. Yep. No, uh, it's just not going to be that way. And so in addition to kind of preparing the next generation and helping them recognize the power that they have, which I am very optimistic that they will have and exercise, we have to do our work to make sure that there's an opening for them to succeed. Exactly, And that means like being really humble about ourselves and dismantling a lot of the crap that we have built up. Yeah. And it takes, and you have to be real with yourself. I know that Absolutely. mirror hurts, yeah. but we all have to <laughs> pull right. it up and look at it and deal with it. Right. Now, before I go, because we've been having such a great conversation about politics and relationships. So what do you do for you? Like, are you, you know, is this all you do day and night is just focus on this? Because someone who's watching you is like, okay, so what does Carrie, you know, do now? Yeah, so, I mean, kind of. This is something that I find really interesting and really fascinating, and it's largely just because of how I spent my life growing up, right? right. 
I grew up in town, I was like the only black girl. And so I thought I was the blackest chick in America. Like if you had found me at 17, you would have been like, I would have been like, Carrie, are you like biracial? No. Yeah. <laughs> black. Like yeah. I was so convinced that I was the blackest person anyone had ever seen. Um, and then I went to college and was routinely confused for a Latina. Yeah. And I was just like, what? <laughs> How could anyone possibly think I'm a Latina? I'm yeah. so, I'm like Naomi Campbell, yeah. right? <laughs> but it was only because I was the only black person people saw. Right. And so so that warped my identity and then that warped how I saw myself. And then sort of when I was 19 and 20, I I to, truly I was, <laughs> I was 19 and I was at college. And I overheard some girls talking. They were talking about a light-skinned girl and I was like, "Ooh, where is she at?" I like literally were... looked behind me, had no idea that I would be like, did not think of myself as light skinned. And so <laughs> I know it sounds really dumb now, but and and so I went through this whole process where then I, I kind of got more sophisticated. And I realized that I essentially had the exact same views and biases that all my white peers did. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and so I had to go through this process myself of like really unlearning stuff and like, I, you know, my, my neighborhood was really waspy. There were no Catholic kids. A Catholic kid came to school all on Ash Wednesday, hand to God, I tried to clean the ashes off his head. Oh no. Hand to, was like, babe, oh God. There's something. <laughs> Can you imagine? Oh, I mean, my it's humiliating. Gosh. It's so embarrassing, but I did it. And <laughs> so I've <laughs> undergone this process of myself. Yeah. And I know that I'm a thousand times better and life is so much like it, everything is better because of it and yeah. so it is something that I talk about a lot because it's a construction right and one of the things that I experienced when I was in the White House and was leaving the White House is you can have a transformational once in a generation type of president type right. of leader but that person can only go as far as the culture will allow Mm. Hillary Clinton's political career would only go as far as the cult culture would allow. Barack Obama as president would, could only enact things as far as the culture would allow and the culture just wasn't there. And what creates our culture? Media, right? And so I started, when I left the White House, was just like, I've got to get in this culture space. I got to work with people who are creating culture right. and doing it in new and innovative ways and breaking out of this like old, tired worldview right. that persists. Um, and so, yeah, so this is kind of what I do all day long. <laughs> so does this mean you have time for a relationship? Are you in a relationship? I am not really. It's a gray area. Oh, it's complicated. Yeah, it's a complicated. What if a nice gentleman wanted to take you out? He's very sophisticated. Well, you know, he's doing his thing. I mean, are you open to that? Or yes. Okay. So what is your Instagram and Twitter? <laughs> give it, give it, just just give it for the people. At Carrie Twig. <laughs> this is so, you know, I think it's so important because you do this work every day and, you know, it gets exhausting, man. It's Yo, draining. It's, it's, it's hard. It's just sometimes you wake up, you're like, I don't even know yeah. where today is going to take me. I just, I can't. Today's just not the day. So it's also nice to know that, um, one, you want to be loved. You want to feel appreciated. And on those hard days, you know, you have your family and friends for sure. But, you know, maybe there's a boo out there who's trying to help That's you right. out. You know. Try make my life a little easier. Just a little mm -hmm, bit. Just mm -hmm. on those hard days, like, hey, you're going to get through it. Send me a nice text. <laughs> yeah. That's good. That's okay. Good. Yeah. All That's right, important. Good. That's an important part. Self-care. So <laughs> loving your community. Loving your people. Yeah. <laughs> Loving me, it's all very important to the movement. Absolutely, <laughs> gotta keep me going. Does he have to be as informed yes. as you? Yes. Are I you mean, willing to help though? Yeah, I mean, one, I think just as a personal trait, intelligence is something that's really important. If we're gonna yes. be around each other, then like I, you know, you don't need to know the same set of things that I do, but I would really hope that we are engaged in a rigorous intellectual process. I think it's important when you, I think it's really important that people share some, that there's some center to the Venn diagram right. of interests, For right? Because sure. if you're, I was on a date once actually. Oh man. And the guy was like, so you're like woke like all the time. I was like, oh, oh Jesus, God. like save me. And granted it was our, that was our first and last date, but 
he's really smart, but he was just like, I don't like thinking about this stuff. And I see it everywhere. And so it's both nice to have someone who can take you out of that space, but at the same time, they got to be in it. You got to be in it, right? Yeah. Like we'll, we'll escape it together and we'll, you know, yeah. but like you got to, you got to care about this stuff because it's, it's, you know, suffocating. Yeah. <laughs> Because it's oh, strangling every day. It is. <laughs> every day. It's just, I can't breathe. How can people yeah. be so stupid at times? I know. Well, I love it. I am so happy that you're here to talk to us. Now, Carrie, we want you to always come back and talk to us when things Absolutely. are popping out here. And you're like, listen, people need to know what is happening out here. These policies are going on. These are things you might want to be aware of. I think it's really important that um, like minds and those who want to really be better for themselves, for their country, for the world, help each other with whatever they have. So, you know, whatever I have, I always want brilliant people to be able to share their ideas and spread it to the world because we need it. You know, and yeah. it's it's different when we talk about it, like, oh man, and we gotta get together. It's another thing when we really apply it. So anytime, you know, we're we're gonna look at you as a guru now. Okay. <laughs> like you gotta help the people out. And you know, anytime things are happening out here, just know hot ninety seven, we're here for you and you know, we're always gonna make sure that we're available to make the correct message reach the people who need it. Well, thank you so much for having me. This has been great. Of course. Yeah. And we're going to get you on a cute date and all that. You yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> Carrie, thank you so much for hanging out with thank us today. You. Thank you.